Hello and welcome to Truth Triumphant Radio. I am your host Cody Mori, and today I actually wanted to take a step back and continue with our discussion on evolution. There's actually a few more episodes I want to do on this topic and it's because as I've stated in the past that the reason we are here now comes from a stepping away from God and where does that stepping away from God start? Well, it starts with unbelief. When you have unbelief, eventually you have, as the uh, the old cliche sort of goes, you have that God-sized hole, and then you seek for other things to fill it, whether it starts with you know pleasure-seeking or then it becomes some type of religion. And I think with all the things that are going on now, with all the, the clear pushing from um, really Catholicism, pushing the... And I'm not talking about Roman Catholics individually. I'm talking about the system here. I'm talking about the whole hierarchical antichrist structure of the Roman Catholic Church. And as you see them pushing this left uh, radicalism, which is what we're seeing today, you know, so similar to as we saw in the 1960s, but even even in the even the 90s don't look like what we're seeing today and we're seeing people that are more concerned with how they are offended than with anything else and and interesting oddly ironically enough their talks about being offended has resulted many times in violence they're pulling pe in these quote unquote peaceful protests you know, the cops are the enemy. They want autonomous zones. They want, as I read, that if we don't get what we want, you know, we're going to basically burn this whole thing down. So these these groups that are seeking um, toleration and, and, and peace, uh, they're anything but. So, and, and all of that goes back to the stepping away from God that we have seen really throughout the globe in the last 50 or 60 years well at least it's been going on since before that but it really picked up steam at that time um, so yeah I want to talk about evolution I want to talk about where it came from it doesn't originate with Charles Darwin it actually originates much much earlier the world I this is this is my theory uh, the world was just ready at the time when he presented the idea of evolution, the world was much more ready to accept it than they were in previous times, uh, at least on a global scale. And this is this is the religion of the of the militant atheist. This is the religion of communism. All this coexist stuff sort of falls out from that, you know. Um, and really, what is it attacking? At the end of the day, the, the only enemy, it's not Islam, right? Islam, we that you have Islamophobia if you think it's Islam. Um, it's Christianity. Every time, it's Christianity. That's why the, the homosexual movement, that's why they'll go into Christian bakeries and, and then sue them and bring it to the Supreme Court and, not do, and then at the same time not do that to Muslim bakeries because the Muslims won't serve them either. Okay, and all this all this comes back, and especially if you read Romans chapter 1, which perhaps if we have time we will take a look at. Um, but Romans chapter 1 talks about, you know, thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. And knowing God, they glorified him not as God, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So they, they, that's where it starts. It starts with unbelief, and this is one of the catalysts of it. And we got to remember here that all these evolutionary ideas, they are built on really nothing more than a bunch of conjectures, really just a, a bundle of men's ideas. And they, one idea, someone will build off of that idea. But the first idea was never really proven to begin with. So as we get involved, when we take a look at this evolution in history, I want to go to John chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. It says, and that's the Gospel of John, 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, so y did you hear that? It's we're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. In other words, evolution is not how it happened. It wasn't the will of man. It wasn't the will of the flesh uh, and genes and chromosomes, etc., wanting to evolve through time. It wasn't the will of the flesh. It was the will of God. It was the will of God. We see this also. To sort of caveat off this, we see in Psalm chapter 33, verses 8 through 10, it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He make the devices of the people of none effect. So, he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. In other words, God has been involved directly with creation. He didn't set these things in motion uh, like, a, like a watchmaker would make a watch and wind up the watch and then step away. He's been involved. He's involved with every creation there is. And that's what, that's what the Genesis account records. It records him saying, speaking things into existence. And that's what Psalm 33 says. It says, he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. In other words, he said, let there be trees, and there were trees right there. They obeyed his commands. So the Bible is directly opposed to this idea. Directly opposed to this idea. But what are you going to see in the students' textbooks? You're going to see chapter after chapter, especially the biology textbooks. You're going to see chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter devoted to these ideas of spontaneous generation how uh how natural selection you know makes evolution work um you know the integration of the species it's and the primordial soup idea the big bang theory etc cetera, etc cetera. it's gonna the whole basically the whole textbook especially biology textbook is going to be dedicated to that theme that's going to be an overarching theme within the textbook what you're not going to see, what you're not going to see is the thousands upon thousands of archaeological discoveries that prove the Bible, the manuscripts, the amount of manuscripts, something like 6,000 manuscripts that we have that prove the Bible, that prove its ancient origins, that it wasn't just some fly-by-night individual that just wrote these things down. We're not gonna we're not gonna learn about Isaac Newton and his belief in God. We're not gonna learn about all the other inventors and innovators, the father of oceanography and the father of different sciences that literally looked to the scriptures and saw scientific ideas within them and based the, used that basis, the Bible, to basically to, to bring in new inventions and new new fields of science to the forefront, which again would prove the Bible. We're not going to see that. What we're going to see is the things I'd mentioned previously. And I'm, I'm very excited today. We actually have a, I have a quite a lengthy quote here from uh, the 80s Club newsletter of March 2005. Uh, it's a Sri Lankan social club in Melbourne, Australia. And it was written by the editor, Richard Young, it's as I said, it's quite lengthy, but it talks about kind of the the degeneration of of really the historic Christian countries in Western civilization uh, over the course of time, and it really can be traced back to you know, push the pushing of God away from from our lives. You know, He's our protection, and and that's what we've gotten away from. But this idea of evolution. It doesn't, it doesn't start with Charles Darwin. He popularized it. But this stuff, it goes all the way. If you read Ellen White, this stuff goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. There was unbelief there. Even Pharaoh, he said, who is this, who is this God? 
Um, but I have a I have a few names here and dates of of things that were introduced in evolution long before Charles Darwin. First individual, Anaximander. A-N-A-X-I-M-A-N-D-E-R, for those of you who want to look it up. 610 to 546 B.C. That's over a thousand years before Charles Darwin. He introduced the idea of spontaneous generation. And for those of you who had listened to our program where we discuss this, spontaneous generation is the idea that uh, evolution does happen, but it happens very rapidly. So something will happen in the environment that makes the environment maybe volatile to life in some way. And, and animals, plants, the ecosystem in general is forced to rapidly evolve to be able to adapt to the environment. And this, this happens really so rapidly that it's within a couple generations. In other words, so there, the, this would explain why there's not missing links. And, and, and you see, that's based off of absolutely nothing. That is a complete conjecture. Really what it's based off of, and, and Jay Gould, they'll talk about this, that there's evolutionists that will admit this, okay? That it's based off of nothing, it's just a conjecture. That a big problem in evolution is that they the missing links are missing. <laughs> See, we don't find intermediary species. We don't find a species slowly changing over into another. All we find is other kinds of animals that are dead. They're different kind. They're completely different kinds of animals, though. We don't find missing links so due to the lack of evidence to support the theory of evolution they came up with spontaneous generation and as we can see they didn't come up with it themselves this is this is an older belief but is it's very convenient that when your theory does not have any evidence that you can explain away the evidence by introducing another theory which is spontaneous generation in this instance. Oh, that's we don't have any missing links because it happens so fast. There's no links to to view. Uh, well, anyways, I looked up Anaximander on Encyclopedia Britannica uh, online, the article on Anaximander, and it says this: Axon Anaximander held an evolutionary view of living things. The first creatures originated from the moist element by evaporation. Man originated from some other kind of animal, such as fish. Since man needs a long period of nurture and could not have survived if he had always been what he is now. So in other words, because human beings require to be taken care of, that they must have evolved from something like a fish, which is basically ready to go as soon as it's born. But also, notice there, it says, uh, the first creatures originated from the moist element by evaporation. That's the belief in the primordial soup. That's the belief that water and rocks essentially were heated, uh, lightning and all the storms and everything happened on the oceans, and then... Eventually, at the bottom of the ocean, this heat and energy and everything sprouted the first single-cell life forms, which started the whole cycle of evolution which we have today. That's the belief. And again, this is, this is completely based off of conjecture. This, this individual, Anaximander, he's a Greek philosopher. He's not a scientist. Okay, he's just, he's just thinking these things into existence. Okay, but this is what's taught in the schools. This is what's taught in the schools, um, and and I think it's important to sort of point out that how old this this theory really is, because I think people many times are sort of they think that, you know, they see the industrial revolution going on in the 1800s and and continue progressing and advancing and advancing and advancing, and 
they they see okay Charles Darwin comes and now we have evolution and that's simply not the case it was an idea that had already been around for a very very long time it's a very old idea actually as we saw it's over a thousand years older than Charles Darwin's book Origin of Species so it's, this is not some new concept this is something that has always uh, encountered Christians and it simply didn't take root because people believed their Bibles and people trusted their Bibles and people have bore, bore fruit from doing that societies have benefited the Industrial Revolution the free world that we have rights which come from God the understanding of that in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence all those are fruits of believing the Bible not fruits of Charles Darwin or his predecessors. But anyways, here's another one. Empedocles from 495 to 455 BC came up with, well, observed, really observed, because this is this is a true statement here, survival of the fittest and natural selection. And we do see that. You see that the fittest typically survive better than the unfit. If something's unfit, it has a much stronger chance. You know, if a great white shark is chasing a bunch of seals and one seal swims much slower than the rest, which is the one that is going to be eaten? Well, clearly, survival of the fittest. We can see that. And natural selection. Here's the problem with natural selection. Natural selection, it's really it's in the name itself. Natural selection selects from the gene pool of information which is already available. It doesn't create new information. It doesn't force something to evolve. It only forces something like, for instance, if you take and I'm I'm sort of picking low bearing fruit here, but this this one just makes sense to me in, in a very simple way. And that's like dogs. People breed dogs, they breed out the genes they don't want, they breed in the genes they do want. The fact of the matter is, every dog on Earth all have the same uh, information inside their DNA. That's why you can breed them together. That's why you can breed different dogs. And people breed more purebred, and typically the purebreds usually have more problems because they're not allowing the mixture of DNA they're they're trying to control it's really unnatural selection is what's going on a human being is unnaturally selecting the genes that they want and they get something like like a teacup chihuahua and the thing is you're never going to you're never going to go into the wilderness and find a pack of teacup chihuahuas and the reason why you're not going to find that is because Teacup chihuahuas will be, they won't be predators, they will be prey. They will be just completely wiped out if they are, if they're out in the wild. They can't survive. So, but they're still a dog. So the dogs with certain particular traits, certain particular physical structures, they'll survive to pass on their genes, their particular genes that they, that their DNA has selected. And over time, most of the dogs will look the same, something like wolves. They, they look very similar. They have a, a, a way of, of looking and being because that's the most conducive for their survival. That's why they look similar. And then with dogs, you have you know human beings taking care of them many times. So you have unnatural selection going on. If that makes sense. All right, going on. There's another man, uh, Diogenes, from 412 to 323 BC. Came up with, well, not came up with, but also said, uh, talked about the primordial soup. The primordial soup as the origin of life. Diomocritus. D-E-O-M-O-C-R-I-T-U-S, for those of you who want to look it up, uh, from 460 to 370 B.C., talked about how things can mutate and adapt, so evolution, essentially, long before Darwin. Lucretius, 
in 99 to 55 BC stated that all life came from Mother Earth. Giordano Bruno from 1548 to 1600 argued against creation for evolution and that's during the time of the reformers so this is nothing new. From uh, Deutsch Well, this was a article which was translated from German from Deutsch Well. The title of the article is Berlin Human Rights Conference Stands Up to Nationalism and Religious Fundamentalism written by hein uh, Daniel Heinrich November 12, 2018. It says the Giordano Bruno Foundation is a nonprofit foundation based in Germany that pursues the support of evolutionary humanism. It was founded by entrepreneur uh, Herbert Steffen in 2004. The Giordano Bruno Foundation is critical of religious fundamentalism and nationalism. Religious fundamentalism and nationalism. And what is religious fundamentalism? Religious fundamentalism is when someone believes that their writings are inspired and errant and to, are to be followed to a T, whether it's the Quran or the Bible. You can be you you fundamentally follow the instructions of your holy book or your authority, whatever that is. That's a fundamentalist if it's if it's part of the doctrine, right? You follow the doctrine. And nationalism. Now, the things you're seeing today going on with Antifa and Black Lives Matter, the stuff that the craziness that's going on in Seattle and all these things, all this stuff comes from these sort of belief systems because they attack religious fundamentalism and nationalism. And what do they teach in the schools? They teach evolution alongside all these things. That's how you get militant atheism. That's how you get communism and all these things. So don't be surprised when it coexists and all that stuff. It all, it all falls into place with this. The religions that they want, that the globalists want, is they want a one world religion. So they, they, they need it to be uh, not fundamentalist. Right? They need it to be they need they want to be able to say that Jesus is somehow or other equal to Krishna, equal to Buddha, uh, you know, equal to Muhammad, etc. etc. So when someone says that no, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by him, well then they're a fundamentalist, they're a bigot, they're a misogynist, they're a xenophobe, they're an Islamophobic, whatever. Um, because they want the globalists which will have the Catholic Church's Pope in, installed as the leader of the world, that's one of their enemies, religious fundamentalism. And Christianity being the forefront religion being their enemy. And also nationalism. Nationalism, you know, having pride in your own country. We don't even see that anymore. It's, it's crazy, just even from the 1990s to now, just the, the, the change that you've seen. Don't be surprised because this, this type of teaching, evolution, goes hand in hand with all this. Don't be surprised when you go to the colleges and you see them burning a copy of the Constitution, burning the, the U.S. flag, telling people that preaching the gospel is hate speech because it's, you know, it, it's telling other religions that they're, they're false religions or something. This is... This is just exactly what this article is saying. The foundation is critical of religious fundamentalism and nationalism. And that's what we see in the world today because that's what the globalists want to get rid of. So that, that's why every doctrine of the Constitution, which is one of the things standing in their way, our Constitution of, the, of America, which was founded by Christians upon Christians' principles, so it's really a religiously fundamental document, nationalistic document. Every doctrine of that document will be repudiated. Will be. Because it stands in their way. Now a couple more. Uh, Leibniz from 1646 to 1716 talked about the intermedial species or missing links. 
Buffon from 1707 to 1788. Uh, man was a quadruped, ascended from apes. Helvetius, Helvetius uh, from in 1758 wrote about this. Uh, you had Swedenborg in 1688 to 1772 advocated and wrote on early versions of the Big Bang Theory, as did Immanuel Kant. And then we saw that taken by who and brought to the forefront and really accepted by the world at the time? The Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church, whether they're using Teilhard de Chardon to actually commit fraud to try to convince people that evolution is true, or um, a Catholic priest to promote the Big Bang Theory, as we saw, also Jesuit trained. But now I want to read this lengthy quote, and it's sort of, as again, as I've said before, it talks about uh, where we have slowly over time, maybe not so slowly, depending on how you look at it, um, but over time how we've just degraded as people. And I think it's really interesting. It's by uh, Richard Young. And remember, this is the, the 80s Club newsletter of March 2005, uh, social group in Melbourne, Australia. It says this. <clears throat> Let's see. I think it started when Madeline Mary O'Hare complained she didn't want any prayer in our schools. We said, okay. Then someone said, you better not read the Bible in school. It says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and love your neighbor as yourself. We said, okay. Dr. Benjamin Spock said we shouldn't spank our children because their little personalities would be warped. We said, okay. Then someone said that school teachers and principals should not discipline children when they misbehave because they did not want any bad publicity and they surely did not want to be sued. We said, okay. Then some of our top elected officials said it did not matter what we did in private as long as we did our jobs. And agreeing with them, we said it did not matter to us what anyone did in private, as long as we had jobs and the economy was good. Then someone said, let us print magazines with pictures of nude people and call it wholesome, down to earth, appreciation of the beauty of, bo of the body. We said, okay. Then someone else took that appreciation a step further and publicized pictures of nude children, and then went further still, making them available of all and sundry on the internet. We said, okay. They were entitled to their freedom of expression. Then the entertainment industry said, let's make TV shows and movies that prom promote profanity, violence, and illicit sex, and let's record music that encourages rape, drugs, murder, suicide, and satanic themes. We said, it's just entertainment. It has no adver adverse effects on, and nobody takes it seriously anyway. So go right ahead. Now we're asking ourselves why our children have no conscience why they don't know right from wrong, and why it doesn't bother them to kill strangers, their classmates, and themselves. Probably, if we think about it long and hard enough, we can figure it out. I think it has to great to, a great deal to do with we reap what we sow. Dear God, why didn't you save the little girl killed in her classroom? Sincerely, concerned student. Dear concerned student, I'm not allowed in schools. Sincerely, God. Funny how simple it is for people to trash God and then wonder why the world is going to hell. And you can find that in Jonathan Gray's book, for The Forbidden Secret, page 568 to 570. 568 to 570. And it's interesting that that is exactly what we see in the world today. We see just unadulterated violence, just violence and death and sex and drugs everywhere and we call it entertainment we call it freedom of speech but then when people want to when people want to talk about the coronavirus and our leaders or people want to talk about how face masks um are not conducive for health those people are censored but the people that want to talk about sex drugs and all these things they're glorified and it, it's simple to see. How did we get here? It's, it starts with when we stepped away from God. And that's why the answer, if there is an answer, is to get back to God. It's to get back to God and not in a lip service manner, but true repentance, true revival, 
true reformation. And I think we're on the brink of a false revival right now. I really do. But what we really need is a real coming to the Lord and just laying everything at his feet and asking him to come into our lives. That's what we need. That's what we need. So I have a, one more quote here, and we'll close from uh, Ellen White from the book Education, page 128. It says this, Scriptures, so today, by the pleasing sentiments of higher criticism, evolution, spiritualism, theosophy, and pantheism, the enemy of righteousness is seeking to lead souls into forbidden paths. To many, the Bible is a lamp without oil because they have turned their minds into channels of speculative belief that bring misunderstanding and confusion. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the mosaic record of the creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution from the earth from chaos. And in order to accommodate the Bible and to the supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast, indefinite periods, covering thousands or even millions of years. Such a conclusion is wholly uncalled for. But just think about that for a second. They have turned their minds into channels of speculative belief that bring misunderstanding and confusion. That's what we see. We see all these ideas, and that's all they are. There are. They are ideas. They are not proven science. But what do we see all throughout the textbooks in our public schools? We see... We see this idea of evolution, and we never see the evidence of creation. Well, we're about out of time. I hope this message was a blessing to you. We hope to catch you next time here right on Truth Triumphant Radio. I've been Cody Mori, so we will catch you next time. God bless.